This is all drawn with my teeth on a thin layer of birch. And I like to uh, draw bees because if it wasn't for bees, we wouldn't have all the food that we have today. But I like to challenge myself and do all kinds of things. Like I've been able to bite like a polar bear on an ice floe and all different kinds of animals. I was born in Churchill. I'm a member of the Peter Ballantyne Band in Saskatchewan, and I'm a mother and a cookum. And in Cree, the word cookum means grandmother, and I believe in volunteering in whichever community I live in. So Churchill is the fourth province away, away from us right now, and this is the Hudson Bay. This is the ocean, and so this is where Churchill is. At one time, they were going to put it as the capital of Nunavut because it's very far, far north. And when you're going to Churchill, there's only two ways you can get there because there's no road. So you either go by train or by plane. And right now, our train is de um, derailed, and it has been for about a year. So it's very hard for the people to get food and stuff right now because everything is flowing in. But Churchill is the polar bear capital of the world, and it's the beluga whale capital of the world. And it's one of the best places to watch the northern lights. And I never learned how to do birch bark biting there because there's little or no trees. Our trees are very one-sided. They're like bonsai trees, like they're old, but they're missing lots of branches on the north side. Polar bears are up to 10 feet high. They're seven to 10 feet high. And we encourage people to go in tundra buggies because it's not safe just to be walking around taking pictures of polar bears. So these are tundra buggies, and if I was to stand beside a tundra buggy, I'd only be like up to the top of the tire. These are more pictures of tundra buggies. It's a good place to watch the northern lights. Our trees are really super one-sided. And then you hardly ever see trees, period. It's all rock and tundra. And you would never get that close to a mother and two cubs. Um, this is the shores of the Hudson Bay. <coughs> so when you're at the ocean, what's different than a river or a lake is that the tide goes in and out. And the tide is controlled by the moon. So there's lots of seaweed on the shore. Our ice, though, has only gone out about three months of the year and then it starts to freeze. So our ice doesn't break up until probably the end of June. And icebergs are larger on the bottom than the top. So this is called White Bear Adventures. In Cree, we would say Wapas. That's how we say White Bear. And so people camp out like in teepees so that they can observe the northern lights. So I've been an artist pretty well all of my life. I started doing artwork when I was about five years old. And uh, later, about 35 years ago, I became a clothing designer. And I incorporated First Nations clothing, um, artwork to my, to my clothing, uh, like porcupine quill work, moose hair tufting, and bead work, and hand-painted clothing. And lots of uh, fur was incorporated on our clothes. <coughs> And I worked at the Friendship Center, and at that time, I was helping artists market their work. That's the first time I seen birch bark biting, and I was just like surprised. I thought, wow, I could never do this. But the only thing that stops you from doing anything is yourself. No matter what you want to do in life, you just have to step out of the box and try. So Angelique, she was world-renowned for her artwork. She started selling her work for 50 cents a piece in the 50s. And she is from the same reserve as me, and I didn't know that because I never lived there. I lived somewhere else. And uh, I didn't know that she was probably related to me. <laughs> I'm a self-taught artist. When I moved to a reserve called Moose Lake, there was no jobs or anything, and I used to volunteer in the school, doing art with the, with the youth. And one child asked me if I knew how to do birch bark biting, and I said, no, but I'll try. So I started experimenting with it. I'm a self-taught artist, and I go through roughly 13 stages to finish a piece. This is Angelique's work, and she lived in a place called uh, Beaver Lake. Um, the birch tree is the second tree to come back after the Ice Age. 
For First Nations people, this was part of our education system. We used birch for lots and lots of things. Um, these are birch bark bitings that are in the Smithsonian Museum, and they're very old. I was told that each bite mark represents a spirit, also that it was done for the shaking tent ceremony. I don't know what's happening there, but it looks like some kind of ceremony is going on in the middle one. This one kind of looks like Martians or maybe people holding hands. And over there, it's either a turtle or maybe a beaver. I don't know what they were trying to depict. And birch bark bitings has many teachings. Most of all, it teaches us respect because as First Nations people, we were given four types of medicine. We were given tobacco, sweetgrass, sage, and cedar. So when we pray, we usually um, offer tobacco if we're taking something from the earth, or if we're going hunting, we offer tobacco or fishing. And so it teaches us about respect. It teaches us about sharing and caring, and also about <coughs> healing. Because when I'm biting a turtle, I can't think about the problems I had last week or the problems in the future, because I have to create the image within a certain amount of space. It teaches you imagination, confidence, focus, and lots of patience. Because when you have to go in the bush and collect birch bark, and you're fighting mosquitoes and worms and all kinds of stuff, and you're looking for hours just to find a particular color, and something that has no knots. You have to have lots of patience and also to peel it and to burn it. Because I burn the edges and birch bark is a fire starter. And I can't go to Walmart and buy my material. A lot of people ask me, do you go to Michael's and buy your material? No, I have to do the same thing that our people have done for thousands of years, to go in the bush and actually do my own harvesting. Um, so here I am collecting bark offering my tobacco. This piece of bark took me almost four hours to find. So it was like walking around, walking around, and I was just getting tired of it, and I was ready to give up, and I found that piece. So you can see there's only one knot, because birch trees have lots and lots of knots. So that's that's a um, hard part, is finding something that has no knots. That's a print of my work, so I can blow my work up to 10 stories high if I wanted to. Um, some of the history, families went out in the spring to collect birch. This was part of our education. So if you were a First Nations child, you would have to learn how to build a canoe because that's how we harvested our food. That's how we hunted. And long time ago in Canada, there was no <coughs> roads. The only way we traveled was by the water and by the rivers. And so there was no roads. So we had to build really, really good birch bark canoes. We could build dwellings out of birch bark because it's very like waterproof. Um, people were born onto birch bark because if you peel the birch and you peel a layer, it's like totally sanitary. Um, people when they passed away were wrapped in birch, so they would take it and wrap around the person instead of um, putting you in a wooden box. Um, also, our ceremonies and stories and everything was recorded because we didn't have a written language. Our language was an oral language. So our elders would pass the stories on from generation to generation. I was also told that uh, when somebody became the hereditary chief, there was a package, and that package had birch bark bitings in, and it was passed on to the next generation. It would have our designs and our stories and where's the best place to hunt and our ceremonies would be in that package and it would be passed on. Um, also in the springtime, has anybody ever eaten maple syrup? <coughs> well, we would make our own syrup because birch water is probably the best water in the planet to drink because it has little or there's, there's certain nutrients that are in the birch water that's not in regular water. And so once you collect your birch water, by tapping, first you tap a, um, like kind of like a spout into the tree, and then you hang your pail, you gather your birch water, and then from there, after you drink as much as you need, then you boil it, and you boil it and boil it down until it becomes a syrup, and then you have birch syrup. Um, there is a new, there's a sweetener that they've, I don't know how long it's been since they've known about birch 
um, sweetener. It's called xylitol. They're putting it in candy. They're saying that birch bark um, uh, prevents gum disease and tooth decay. So it was very good for our teeth. So now they're putting it into toothpaste. <coughs> and also it's an art form. So here is a birch canoe. And like I said, our people traveled the river routes, and it's a very huge canoe. And it would take a lot of work just to collect all the material that you need for that perfect canoe. Because you need like you need to have sinew, you need to have certain kind of roots, and you need to have spruce gum. There's lots of things that you need to add to it. Also, the birch baskets. They say that cooking pots were made that would last up to 10 years. Can you imagine, like even today, our cooking pots don't last up to 10 years. They usually break down somehow. Um, and so people would make cooking pots. They'd make baskets like that for, for picking berries or storing meat and stuff in it. And so this is the inside of the tree. And if you scratch it off, you would be able to make these kind of designs. And we would use bark and leaves for certain kind of remedies. We'd use it for smudging, but also to make different kinds of tea. So we would make tea to create um, tea to deal with skin conditions, arthritis, kidney, bladder problems, and digestive problems. We also collect something called chega. And chega is a, a growth that's on a birch tree, and it's used for cancer medicine. I go through roughly 13 stages before I finish a piece. I use earth, wind, water, and fire in all my work. So I go through 13 stages, and then at the end I frame it. So the birch bark biting sometimes only takes me minutes, but it's all the different stages put together. So a piece might take me like, 10 hours or 12 hours and you add it all up. Um, and also they recently found out that um, birch bark biting develops your spatial reasoning in your brain. So our people did this, we taught our children very early because what it does is, is it helps you to do better in math, better in science and better in architecture if you can do your spatial reasoning. And it's thinking with the mind's third eye. So this is just a sample of spatial reasoning. It's taking an object and fitting it into a certain amount of space. So if I'm going to bite a turtle, I have to think in my mind exactly how far I am on the birch bark so I don't go off it. I have to stay within that amount of space. Does anybody have questions? I'm going too fast. OK. and. Uh, just recently, they asked me to include a piece of my art into their education book to show the connection between spatial reasoning and birch bark biting. How many of you think you can't? Yeah? Um, I was just wondering about the birch syrup. Like, does it taste like <coughs> maple syrup? Like, does it taste no, similar? it's got a different taste. It tastes like birch syrup. It's a different taste. But because there's sweetener in the tree, it's um, a certain kind of sweetener. It's called xylitol. It's, it's similar to whatever would be in a birch tree, I guess. And because you make maple sugar, right? And so we make xylitol sugar, I guess. I don't know who came up with that name. It's probably a Latin name or something. No. Um, so anyways, this is just a question. How many of you think you can't do this? You can't do this? I'm very influenced. Okay. Um, I just want to reassure you guys, the only way you cannot do this is if you don't have teeth. So, <laughs> you got teeth? You got teeth? Okay, you're all good then. And um, i just like to tell you that we bite with 100 pounds of pressure with our teeth. Any one of us could bite that hard. So we bite on candy, we bite on gum, we bite on all kinds of things. So biting on a thin piece of birch, you know, we can actually do it. Yeah. So I usually start teaching my grandchildren that when they're about two years old. And I never dreamt that. Like when I was a child growing up in Churchill, I lived in a very rough place and uh, I had a lot of problems in my home. There was a lot of alcohol abuse and stuff. 
And I never dreamt that I would be able to create my own job or that I would be traveling. And so um, I've traveled to Europe several times. I've had an art show at the United Nations and also at the newest museum.